Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to segment number seven of the Instant Reaction Podcast alongside College Hoops Digest founder Josh Adams and senior writer and a good friend of our brand, both of you guys, Dan Stack. Both of you guys, good to see you. How are things on your side, Josh Adams of the river? Ah, things are well, Joey. Thanks for having me. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Yeah, man, you as well. I can't believe it's uh, you know the first time that we've we, we've had you on the podcast. And uh, Dan Stack, good to see you too. How are things north of uh, north of where we are? Ah, uh, very good. Um, just can't wait to uh, come down to Jersey and uh, take in my usual yearly uh, Seton Hall DePaul game that I cover. Yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt, and we got a chance to see. Uh, we got a chance to see a couple of days ago, of course, Seton Hall take on UConn, and last night was a uh, was a late night late night snoozer, if you will, of course, because you know, listen, what we got to see yesterday with DePaul, uh, they looked good in the first half, and then and then uh, things things went downhill against Creighton last night around 10 o'clock. But first, I want to start off with uh, with Josh Adams, and and you know, College Hoops Digest and Eastern Observer, we're we're very close now. It's a it's a really cool thing that. You know, we've done we've we've met each other, of course, multiple times at uh, at Seton Hall and uh, Jake Zimmer's joined us as well. So, Josh, I got to ask you, you know, I was actually supposed to go up to UConn, but uh, things happened on uh, on Long Island over here. Tell us about how how cool Gamble was. It was your first time and you were so stoked about it when we were talking uh, last week over at the at the Brock. Well, I tell you, there's uh not a lot of atmospheres that I've ever been in that are kind of like gamble. Um, I, you know, I know it's a big kind of controversy with the UConn program. It's should they play all their home games at Gamble or Hartford? And I can tell you from a geography perspective that Hartford and stores are not exactly down the street from one another. I mean, it is, it is a trip to, I mean, stores is legitimately, you're going down a one lane road in the middle of nowhere for about 45 minutes yeah. And then you arrive on UConn's campus. But as far as Gamble goes, wow, it's intimidating, I would think, for any visiting team to come in there. All the men's and women's banners are prominently displayed on the, you know, uh, in the rafters. And, I mean, the student section was absolutely packed an hour and a half before game time. And it's one of the best Big East experiences for sure. And I would recommend it for any any writer or fan to get up there for a game yeah there's no doubt and i was actually up there uh for st john's and yukon and it was during winter break so there really it wasn't that packed and i was pretty disappointed with with what i saw but you know and then of course i see it on tv and it was absolutely you know it was just crazy the atmosphere i was pretty jealous of you but i'm glad that you were able to uh to have a good time but uh guys let's look of course into tomorrow's contest seton hall and depaul uh and of course like i said we've got two guys here that are good friends of our brand and i wanted to make sure that we got both sides of the story here of course one on seton hall side and the other side from depaul and uh i want to start off with you dan stack because you know you've been covering depaul for a long time and of course the last game between depaul and seton hall depaul got the better of Seton Hall and that is something that has been a big problem for Kevin Willard and I remember we spoke both Josh and I spoke about it uh, a few weeks ago when they lost to I believe was to uh, to Marquette and 24 and 25 is uh, Kevin Willard's record in the month of January going back to 2015-16 and DePaul took full advantage in Wintrust Arena and they are going to be without, most likely, one key player that made a big difference uh, in David Jones, who had 24 points, 8 of 14 last night. Dan, he got hurt. It did not look uh, promising either. Yeah, it, it certainly didn't look good. It looks like a high ankle sprain. When you get a high ankle sprain, that's pretty much – that's weeks. Um, that's the guess I'm getting at. Yeah, I was looking at the box score. Yeah, he – the funny thing is, in that first Eaton Hall game, that was when Javon – Freeman Liberty initially got hurt and pulled his groin and he had to get out of the game. And then him, David Jones and Jalen Terry had a very, very good game. That was our point guard. He had 28 points and salted the game away at free foes because the, the Paul had like a 16 point lead, like with like three minutes left or something like that. And they made Satan all made him sweat um, with, you know, clutch free foes down the stretch. I think Yeah. Um, Bryce Aiken had like 12 himself or something in the last three minutes. But yeah, but now we got J Javon Freeman Miller back, but now we got David Jones out. David Jones out, so it's like one step forward, one step back, two steps back. So uh, we're yeah, still going with yeah. the step. Now we're going to go with a seven man rotation again, and I don't know. I, I just don't like the uh, the chance for a sweep. At, very good at, at this time because you know we're working with uh, an under I mean, uh, uh, shorthanded 
roster and uh it, it's in, in a hostile place like that for a primetime matchup i don't know yeah and especially now that things looks like josh adams finally are getting back to normal for seton hall uh regardless of that five point loss against uconn uh this is the time where seton hall usually shines and uh and coming in against a uh, a DePaul team that, again, they that they lost by double digits to Creighton yesterday, but they also really are looking for revenge from that January 13th loss uh, against DePaul, of course. And now we got a chance to hear also that uh, there's a good chance, according to Kevin Willard, but you and I, well, we, we know that Kevin Willard's word means absolute zilch. He says that Bryce Aiken most likely is not coming back. Uh, he hasn't practiced. He hasn't done anything. He, he doesn't know what to say to us. Well, you know, it's it's interesting. You kind of read through the tea leaves with, with Bryce Aiken because uh, just alone after the UConn game, uh, Willard told uh, Dave and Gary on the radio that Aiken's out for the year. Then he told me and Adam Zagoria that most likely he's out for the year but doesn't know. And then we talked to uh, Jameer Harris after the game who kind of looked at the strange and go, went, I don't know. I think he might be coming back. You know, we, we have his back. So – who knows? I the concussion is a, it's one of those weird things where I think all of us have had one and everyone expects you to recover. But I, who knows? We're not all doctors here. But I think what going forward, I think it's kind of encouraging with Seton Hall that Cadre Richmond and uh, Jameer Harris have kind of taken over the point guard position and have steadily improved. You know, it's definitely a work in progress. But the one thing that I kind of took away from the UConn game from both of them is I think they had two turnovers combined between the two of them. And against UConn's guards, that's pretty that's pretty good. So I think it's time to stop kind of looking in whether Bryce Aiken's coming back or not. I, I think Willard's kind of moved on, and especially with Richmond coming back, that I think maybe he's trying to groom them moving forward in the program. The thing that scares a lot of people, and I think a lot of critics on Twitter, on, on the cesspool of Twitter, of course, Josh, we know that, you know, a lot of people have come out and said, well, you know, if, if Bryce Aiken can't come back, who is going to be that, you know, that point guard behind Kadari Richmond? Who can do it? Because we got a chance to see uh, Kadari Richmond get completely shut down against St. John's in that Walsh gymnasium contest. And there was really no one else who was able to move the ball. And if he can't come back, is there anybody else that could potentially, um, you know, sub in for him if, if he can't go, or if he has a rough game, if, if DePaul were to stop him or even someone, uh, someone down the stretch heading into the big East tournament, would that be a problem? Well, I, I think uh, Harris feels very confident that he can sort of supplement Richmond uh, for stretches. And uh, you see him, Willard's, kind of being more confident in him getting the ball. But I think what you saw UConn doing, especially yesterday, uh, a couple of days ago, was the way to kind of beat Seton Hall is to press them early. And uh, because there there really is sort of a lack, if, if Richmond gets trapped, there really is kind of a lack of people kind of getting to the ball. Yeah, it's, it, you know, hindsight always being 2020 with Aiken's injury history, should have they relied on Aiken so much this season and you know with his history and probably not but that said I think between Richmond and Harris it's definitely going to be serviceable going down the stretch here yeah now now Dan I, I want to look back of course to the Creighton game from last night and Creighton led 32 18 in the paint but now my question to you is is that you know how do you go up against a uh a, a front court like I uh Ike Obiagu Alexis Yetna Tyree Samuel and you know I mean listen you're on I he's he's if I pronounce that name right, he did pretty well against uh, against Seton Hall in the last game. He had eight boards, 11 points, three blocks, uh, and nine for 12 from the free throw line, too. I mean, the three blocks really stands out in the last game as well. Can that be replicated uh, tomorrow night at the Rock? I think so. I think the uh, the bigs of DePaul are starting to really gel lately as the season goes on later into the season. Uh, we got two guys that are at least 6'10 or bigger, so we have some size. Um in uh, Yorna, you, you, you pronounce it right, and Nick Angenda. Uh, they're both long and lean. But the thing is, the problem with them going against something like Seton Hall, they don't have mus they don't have the muscle mass. They they're very lean. Um, they can get pushed around the point. They're not great. Usually they're not great rebounders, but they're great rim protectors. And that's the good thing about the Paul's defense when all you know, guards dip, dribble drive, they're all 
a little timid to take shots in the paint against the likes of Ana and, and Genda. So, but rebounding and help defense um, is uh, critical for DePaul to uh, try to uh, stem the tide there and match up evenly with Seton Hall's uh, bigger front court as far as, you know, muscle and beef. Yeah, and now also something I want to look at with with you, Dan, is, of course, the Creighton game last night. In the second half, 8 of 29 from the floor. It was a real tough go in the second half. Um, and, 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 of course, this is also the part of the game where Seton Hall really uh, elevates their game in the second half. That's really what we've seen it constantly, time in and time out, Josh Adams. But for you, Dan, you know, if, if that does happen where, you know, they – slow down in the second half to Paul that is, and they have a, a similar shooting night in the second half. Um, will it be a really short night for DePaul? But what, what, what do you see that they can do to uh, get that second half going again? Well, they got to get out in transition. DePaul is pretty much an awful half court team. Um, they got the athletes, but not the more skilled uh, shooters now. And especially without David Jones, that took them a lot out of the room yesterday. Um, him was, he was going off. Um, He was really starting to play well the prior games. Um, You know, he had a triple-double against Georgetown, um, and he was the offense because this is – yesterday was Javon Freeman Limber's second game, so he's just – he's still finding his rhythm, and he shot four for 22 yesterday. So, you know, without Jones and Freeman Liberty still getting his sea legs under him and trying to uh, get better as the season goes on, I just don't see how – DePaul can stay with them. They they, they got to get up and down um, because, like I said, they, their half court offense is not good, and they got they got to share the ball. Um, good to make shots from three. Um, that's something they've been struggling with all year, and um, so it's hard to see them coming out a with an aggressive game plan to take Seton Hall out of their their offensive rhythm. Yeah, and especially, again, coming off of a, uh, a five-point loss up at UConn. Now, uh, the big thing for me, and speaking of big, of course, Josh Adams, looking at Adama Sinogo, what he was able to do against Seton Hall, uh, he had 20 points, 16 boards, three blocks, the usual. And, of course, Seton Hall got really thrown around 40-24 to 24, uh, in the paint. Uh, against this uh, against this DePaul team, is there really, and I don't want to say a lot of effort that they have to put in. Of course, they have to put in, you know, 40 minutes of full full 100% effort. But um, what is really the the one thing that Kevin Willard and company that they have to do in order to just really just, I don't want to say blow by this DePaul team, but to get that revenge from January? Well, first off, don't allow 57 points in the first half, which I believe was is what they allowed against DePaul. And, uh, in the first game. So yeah. I would think it'd be step one for the pirates uh, going the, for what happened against UConn is, and again, they could fall into the same trap against the Paul on Saturday is they couldn't get Roden and Kale involved in the offense early. And those guys are both the spark. You know, they've both been around. They're both kind of the spark plugs. I think, I think Roden had a good game against the Paul. I think he had like 23 or 24 points uh, or somewhere around that against the Paul last time, but Kale was, was a disappearing act. I think he had seven, uh, but uh, again, they, the only time they really kind of got into the game against UConn is when Roden and Kale started scoring into the second half. So it's up, it's really kind of up to Willard to kind of get the, both their engines going. It's, that's, that's really the key. That's what kind of well, uh, the way the pirates win games is, is Roden driving, kicking it out to Kale, hitting a couple threes, getting it going. Cause that frees up opportunities for then Yetna and Jackson to get get kind of clean up shots as well. So Roden and Kale are the, are the, the straws that stir the drink for that offense. Really. Is there any X factor Dan stack that you see, um, you know, or that catalyst that you had brought up about that seven man rotation um, going up against the Seton hall team that, you know, has probably one of the deepest teams that I can think of. And I'm assuming Josh, you agree with me on that one. Uh, one of the deepest teams that we've seen for the pirates. Is there somebody Dan that you see possibly on this DePaul team that could potentially um, either take the next step or potentially join Javon Freeman Liberty and, you know, in, in trying to go up against this, this pirates team. Uh, yeah, there's certainly one player that's starting to play a lot better as the season goes on. Is that's uh, probably the best name in the big East Kuvasie McCauley. <laughs> yeah, so uh, and he's good. Good. He's a great scorer. He's not a great defender, um, but he was a Division II All-American. Um, 
He can really light it up in three. He was phenomenal in the win over in, in uh, at Xavier. I think he had 18 points and he had four, eight from three. Yeah. Um, and then the, and then the next game against Georgetown, he had um, another 14 points. Um, he's a guy that's been glued to the bench. I, he was, he's a, a peculiar case. I mean, both last year, Dave Lato didn't play him at all. And he played Bray Salney, who was just a, a bricklayer last year for the, uh, uh, the, the Blue Demons. And then this year, they, they started with a Juco guy. They got Philmon Gebruit, who had a great non-conference season. But once he got to the Big East, it was like he was a deer in the headlights. And he can't shoot for uh, for nothing right now. And so McCauley has taken the mantle, and he's taken the next step. And he's been giving them a big boost. Um, and he, he, was, he was hitting threes yesterday in the first half. We had a nine-point lead over Creighton yesterday. Um, we just can't close out games. And uh, – but he's been given some uh, coach Subfield a real boost, and uh, his offense will definitely be needed going into the Seton game, Seton Hall game, and the rest of the season going forward. Ray Salnave, Josh Adams, where <laughs> is Jaden Daly when you need him? Uh, <laughs> of course, Monmouth transfer prior to uh, to DePaul. Now he's over at UMBC as a grad. Uh, I want to flip. Left, and, and, and I think he left school. Yeah, he's that, not on the team anymore. Yeah. Oh my God. Unbelievable. He's been, I think what, like four or five different schools, something like that. Ray Salnave. It's unbelievable. I think it's three. I think he started at Monmouth. Did it? Yeah. And then he went to the ball and then UMBC. Uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, all I can tell you guys is, is that, you know, we've got a big game tomorrow and now I kind of want to flip the script a little bit. And Josh, I want to ask you about what your thoughts of DePaul is with Tony Stubblefield, because, uh, you know, we've seen, and Dan, you know, no offense to you and the entire DePaul community, but DePaul has really been almost a laughing stock at the big East for a while. And now it's turned to, De- uh, to Georgetown because they might just go winless. Yeah. What have you seen with this Tony Stubblefield team? That looks like that they could be keyword could be, uh, a force to be reckoned with in a few years. Oh, I think uh, DePaul this year. I, you know, just recent memory, the uh, Providence game. I mean, the, the, without a, a Herculean effort for the Friars, DePaul goes and takes a game from, from Providence at the dunk. So, no, the, the improvement that under Stubblefield for DePaul is, is, is as, as Dan just said, I, you know, closing out games is tough in the big East and, and they're still kind of learning how to do that. You know, even going back to the Seton hall game uh, in earlier this year, and they had a pretty very sizable lead in that game. And uh, it was sort of a masterclass in uh, fouling at the end. I believe DePaul ended up with 45 free throws for that entire game. I mean, the whole last yeah. two minutes, I believe was well, a masterclass in the Pirates kind of fouling and, and uh, uh, getting back into it. It was actually, a, you know, without that, that, that game's more of a blowout, but, yeah, DePaul is one of those teams that you know, they're. I believe they were favored against Providence when Providence came to DePaul. I I, I think people yes. are, are starting to give that team a, a little bit of respect, and rightly so. Uh, it would be interesting because I think they're kind of cut from the same cloth that neither of them can really close out games. You know, you and I sat there for the Xavier game where Xavier just kept – Kind of you know, against Seton Hall, where Xavier just kind of yeah. kept creeping in, and ended up being a two point game. So it's going to be a race to see who can try to blow this game first tomorrow. I think at the mm-hmm. end, and uh, you know, my edge slightly is towards Seton Hall because they're at home. But as for DePaul, very impressive under Stubblefield. I, if I were a Blue Demons fan, I would be uh, very optimistic moving moving forward. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say like the uh, that last half hour in the first game in Chicago. It was the last four minutes. It was literally a half an hour. It was yeah. foul shot, foul shot, foul shot, foul shot. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, last three minutes. Me. It stuck with me. It was. It was one of the most intense kind of you know the old uh, you know foul everyone to get people on the free throw line. I mean, Seton Hall just would not stop from like Dan said four minutes on and really got it back into that game. Yeah. yeah, 36 of 45 from the free throw line in the first game for DePaul and then 29 of 32 from the free throw line for Seton Hall in that 96-92 loss. Now, Dan, for you, you know, we got a chance to see, of course, back in Big East, or back at Big East Media Day back in October how Seton Hall was selected to finish fifth in the, uh, in the, in the Big East Conference by the, uh, in the coaches' poll. And a lot of players took that, uh, you know, they – they were insulted. Uh, I remember that's what Jared Roden said a few times. And Josh, I th- you might be able to uh, 
you know, back me up on that, where yeah. we've gotten to see all, a lot of the players uh, for the Pirates, they were really discre- uh, disgusted by by some of you know what the coaches thought, and all of a sudden, you know, they they don't have that they don't have that Miles Powell, they don't have that Angel Delgado, uh, they don't have that you know that 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 star player, but they're able to get it done. What have you been? What have your thoughts been of this Seton Hall team? Uh, and you know your and and just like what Josh had uh, was his prediction for tomorrow night. I think they're very deep and talented uh, uh, and experienced. It, it, it helps that you have a, a roster like that um, to depend on. I mean, I, like you said, then, you know, they don't have like a superstar, but they got, you know, very talented players at every position. I think um, you got, I mean, Aiken might not play, but you got your steady headstrong point guard experienced. Um, you got to do a, a playmaker like Rhoda can do inside and out. You got, you know, a rebounder and, who could shoot threes like Yetna, and you got your shot block and big man and Oak, uh, excuse me, Ike Obiago down low. Uh, and you got some, you know, talented players coming off the bench. Um, I think they have a recipe. And like you said, I think you guys mentioned that um, Lord always struggles in January, but, or maybe, maybe early January, maybe like late January, February, he starts to get going. So I think if they, if they lose to DePaul, then you got to start worrying about the NCAA tournament. But I think if they win this game, um, I'll say, I really think they'll get it started together and uh, get into the NCAA tournament too. Well, I don't know. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a fun one tomorrow night. But Dan, to close this one out, your uh, your prediction for tomorrow night? Mm. Well, I'm gonna reverse psychology <laughs> here. No, I, I don't think they're gonna win. I think it's I don't think it's gonna be a blowout. Um, it's amazing. Like Vegas has been very kind to us just the last couple of weeks. They had us. On the road at, Dunk, at Dunkin' Donuts, only getting like eight points. And then they favored us against Creighton last night. So I don't know what they see in us. <laughs> but uh, I, I see uh, Seton Hall winning by close to double digits. Let's say eight points. Let's say 78-70. Okay. Well, that is definitely something uh, That's definitely something to look out for. I'll have. I'll take Seton Hall by uh, – by, I'll go with 10. I'll go 10 for right now. Uh, Josh, to get your exact number, what do you got? And and just like how we did last time, what do you got as a score? Or are we going to wait for that for tomorrow? <laughs> oh, Joe, you know I nailed that that Xavier score. Uh, you were all like two points. <laughs> uh, I'm not particularly high on Seton Hall right now. Um, I I think the Villanova loss took a lot out of their sales. I you know even though the UConn never really ran away with that game. The other day, they just didn't seem to be in it. There just didn't seem to be a, a flow, a cohesive flow. So, you know, whether they got home and Willard's good about kind of drawing up stuff and, and maybe getting some motivation, but, you know, I think the team's kind of a little rudderless right right now. But that said, winning winning on the road with Big East is really tough, you know, no matter where you are. And so I, I think Seton Hall wins. I'm going to say 75-70 tomorrow i think it's gonna be within five points 75 70 all right Mm -hmm. well ladies and gentlemen uh it's been a fun one of course uh a good segment number seven for our instant reaction off uh offshoot if you will from uh, the primetime rundown as you can see right behind us here ladies and gentlemen college hoops digest josh adams and senior writer for we are depaul.com's dan stack both of uh, both of those good friends of our brand and myself as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Josh, Dan, thank you so much again. I'm Joey Jarzinka. We will see you next time. Thanks, Joey. Yeah.